Today, I'm going to beat Pokemon Yellow with only a Pidgeotto. Yes, I am going to be doing the middle evolutions. This is actually the second video in this series, because the first one happened last February when I beat the game with only a Dragonair. Honestly, I thought that there would be more middle evolutions, but when you actually take inventory of them, there are not that many. So there are the middle evolutions for the starters, which is three in total. Then there are the middle evolutions of the bugs, Metapod and Kakuna. After that, there is Pidgeotto, Gloom, Weepin' Bell, and Poliwhirl. And then the four mid stages for the trade evolutions. After all that, there's just Dragonair, and that's it. Today I wanted to try out Pidgeotto because I did a Pidgeot stream earlier in the year and a Pidgeot video last year. With this evolutionary line, I am working my way towards the first stage Pokemon. I will do a Pidgey playthrough next year. For all of my solo challenges in Pokemon Yellow, I use the same rules, and you can check them out in the description if you're curious. Now, let's talk about Pidgeotto as a Pokemon. For base stats, it has 63 HP, 60 attack, 55 defense, 50 special, and 71 speed, giving it a 13.67% chance to crit in Generation 1. A fact that I find really interesting is that when Pidgeotto evolves into a Pidgeot, all of its stats increase by exactly 20. When it evolves from a Pidgey, a similar thing happens where most of the stats increase by 15 points, whereas the HP stat increases by 23. Overall, this evolutionary line is not particularly good statistically. Pidgey is completely garbage. Pidgey Pidgeotto is a little bit better, and then Pidgeot is a very underwhelming Pokemon in an evolutionary line. Unless we're talking about style points for fancy hairdos, because then Pidgeot definitely is the best in all of Generation 1. Arcanine, Rapidash, and Ninetales, all of you just be quiet, Pidgeot definitely has better hair than you. Okay, so you might think that with mediocre stats that maybe its move pool is quite strong, but no, its move pool is absolutely awful. It has access to only normal and flying damage dealing moves. Notably, in Generation 1, Gust is a normal move, Wing Attack only has 35 base power, Sky Attack charges on turn 1, doing nothing, you can still take damage, this is not the same as Fly, and then it has a 90% accuracy and no flinch chance. Also, Fly is only base 70 power until Generation 4, so this move isn't very good, and yeah, that's about it. Like, we do have access to Agility to Badge Boost, and Sand Attack to be a complete troll, but other than that, we really don't have much going for us. To top all of this off is the fact that it learns Whirlwind, which doesn't do anything in trainer battles in Generation 1. As a result, I am expecting this run to be quite challenging today. Now I'm going to do a very quick rundown of what happened in my Pidgeot stream, just in case you didn't watch that 4 hour video. The main realization that I had throughout those two playthroughs was the fact that Pidgeot needs access to a high amount of damage in order to KO critical Pokemon during the league. To obtain this level of damage, I had to teach Pidgeot Hyper Beam, which wasted a bunch of time buying coins 50 at a time from the game corner. Yes, this is the fastest way you can do it in Generation 1. In addition to Hyper Beam, I had to go into the league around level 67, which is incredibly late, and even with all of this training and planning, Pidgeot was only able to get a time of 1 hour 6 minutes and 29 seconds. However, there is bad news today for Pidgeotto, because this strategy is not accessible to me. And that's because because only fully evolved Pokemon can learn Hyper Beam. There is one exception here, which is Dratini and Dragonair, who both learn it through level up, but they still don't have access to this move through TM. So today I'm going to have to find a different way for victory with Pidgeot. Now one thing that is working on my side, and you've already been able to see that in the footage from the early game, is the fact that I have a medium slow growth rate. This is the best growth rate to do a solo challenge in generation 1 or 2 with, and that's because it gives me quick level ups in the early game. As a result, I'm able to get to level 10 pretty quickly, and now I want to fight the rival on Route 22. The reason behind this decision here is that if I defeat him, I will face the champion's team when he chooses Jolteon. Now you might say, Scott, this doesn't make any sense, Jolteon is obviously super effective against Pidgeotto, that's just going to make things way harder for you. But that is not the case. The Magneton is way harder to deal with when you are a flying or water type. So by defeating him here, I am actually going to have an easier time later on in the game. Alright, so with that battle out of the way, now I'm going to head to Viridian Forest, and we should talk about Brock, who is coming up next. Luckily for Pidgeotto, I have access to Sand Attack, which is going to provide a way for me to get by his team on a decent level. Still, I want to level up here in the forest as much as is possible, so I'm going to defeat all of the trainers here, and once I take out the mandatory bug catcher, Pidgeotto is almost level 15. That's basically perfect timing, because then in Brock's gym, I can fight the Lightyear's junior trainer. With him out of the way, and my Pidgeotto at level 15, 
let's take on Brock for the first time. Up first is Geodude, and I'm going to start by setting up Sand Attack to make it less likely to hit me. However, I don't want to set up Sand Attack too many times, and that's for a reason that I'll explain later in the battle. For now, I'm only going to use it four times, and then start attacking the Geodude with Quick Attack. Luckily for me, this move gets the same type attack bonus, so even when the damage is resisted, I'm still doing what looks like three or four damage per hit. Even with one critical hit, it takes me six turns to knock the Geodude out, and then Brock sends in his Onyx. Okay, so here I want to set up Sand Attack so this thing is way less likely to hit me. However, I want to mention the fact that Brock's Onyx has Bide. This is why I didn't want to use too many Sand Attacks against the Geodude, because I need some to stall Bide out so that I don't take damage when it unleashes energy. After all, when Bide deals damage, it bypasses accuracy checks. Unfortunately for me, after I use three Quick Attacks, Brock's Onyx goes for Bide, and so I already have to start using some sand attacks, but here's the thing, as it continues to use Bide, I eventually just have to attack into it, and the most painful scenario plays out, I am one attack away from knocking the Onyx out, it unleashes energy, and knocks Pidgeotto out. Here's the thing, in the last battle I wasn't particularly lucky against the Geodude though, so I had very little health left over when the Onyx came out. In the next battle I have more health for the Onyx, I also am a little bit more conservative with my use of Sand Attack, retaining more power points to be able to spam whenever it chooses to use Bide. By doing this, I am slowly able to whittle the Onyx down and take it out. Honestly, I think that this sub 10 minute Brock split with Pidgeotto is quite good for the start of the game. With that victory under my belt, let's head off towards Mount Moon. In here, I want to make sure that I do some extra training. After all, Pidgeotto is like the most mid Pokemon, so I have to train if I am going to have a chance later on in the game. I also fight this last with two grass type Pokemon, and then this youngster with two Rattata and a Zubat. I skip the hiker, of course, heading straight down and fighting the Super. Super nerd. After he is defeated, I grab the Dome Fossil, and then I take on Jesse and James. Now, sometimes this battle is scary, but the fact that I had to overlevel for Brock, as well as the fact that I have a medium slow growth rate, means Pidgeotto is quite overleveled at this point, and I take an easy victory over them. Alright, so we're heading into Cerulean City, and I think in most of my recent runs, it has felt better to face Misty right away, but today, I think that fighting the rival is going to make more sense. After all, with my current speed, I am not going to move first against the Starmie, and that just seems like a recipe for disaster when Pidgeotto has pretty bad special. The rival's team starts with Spearow, I move first, hit quick attack, and get a critical hit, but it's just barely not enough to take it out. Spearow lowers my attack with Growl, and then I finish it off on the next turn. Alright, that is not a great start to the fight when Sandshrew is next. I really need to do a lot to this thing so it doesn't stack up Sand Attacks. In Generation 1, Sand Attack is a normal type move, but even once it gets the ground type in Generation 2, it can still hit flying type Pokemon. However, the Sandshrew doesn't try to use it, instead it just goes for Scratch. I get a critical hit with my second Quick Attack, and that allows me to finish it off in only three turns. Rattata's next, it hits with Quick Attack, taking me down to just over half health. I finish it off. And now, all that's remaining is Eevee. Quick Attack gets a critical hit, taking it under half health. It hits Tackle, doing a little bit to me, and then I finish it off. Alright, so that was an easy battle against the rival. And now on Nugget Bridge, I usually like to check in and see how the Pokemon is doing to this point. My time is just over 14 minutes, which is not great. Then this last is Pidgey starts to use Sand Attack on me, lowering my accuracy twice. In Generation 1, that means you only have a 50% chance to hit. It lowers my accuracy again, taking it down to 40%. And this is actually starting to get kind of scary. Like, I'm on orange health, I knock the Pidgey out, and then she sends in Nidoran. This thing's pretty physically tanky. Luckily, my Quick Attack does a lot of damage. After all, Sand Attack has been badge boosting my attack stat. Nidoran hits Scratch doing a little bit. I miss a Quick Attack. It hits Double Kick, taking me down to red health. And luckily, my next Quick Attack hits, finishing it off. Okay, I'm glad that I defeated this random lass. With her out of the way, all the trainers until Bill's house are completely trivial. I have to walk back to Cerulean City, because this is Pokemon Yellow, not Pokemon Red and Blue. With that all out of the way, it's now time to take on Misty. She leads with Staryu. Now I mentioned before that my speed wasn't enough to outspeed the Starmie. It still isn't, so I'm not going to be able to use Sand Attack on it, but I can use Quick Attack for priority. It doesn't knock the Staryu out, it hits with Water Gun, doing a tiny bit of damage, and then I finish it off. Okay, time for her ace, Starmie. 
I use Quick Attack, it gets a critical hit, doing almost half, and Misty sets up an X Defend. Obviously because of her defense boost, I don't do as much on the next turn. She just uses her less powerful move, Water Gun, but it gets a critical hit and takes Pidgeotto down to half health. Luckily for me, however, my next Quick Attack gets a critical hit, bypassing her defense boosts, and I finish the Starmie off. Okay, time for the rocket outside of Cerulean City. This fight is only scary if the Drowsy gets Hypnosis right away, and it, of course it gets Hypnosis right away. Uh, how long am I going to sleep? One turn, two turns, three turns, four turns, five turns, six turns, and then finally I wake up, but I'm not able to attack on this turn. Also a disabled quick attack, which is just really annoying. Luckily for me, Gust is essentially the same move without priority. I'm able to use it and polish off the Drowsy. So if that fight didn't go well, and the fight against the Lass on Nugget Bridge didn't go well, I assume that my fight against Sandy is probably going to be bad. Of course, Quick Attack does not knock the Pidgeys out in one hit, so they're all going to get a chance to use Sand Attack. The first and the second one don't, and then the third one does, but this is far too late and I'm able to take it out. All right, time for the SSN. I'm gonna pick up Rest here. I also went into the room with Body Slam, fought the trainer, and then realized that Pidgeotto doesn't learn this move, so I guess I'll just sell it later. After that, I fight the gentleman and pick up the rare candy, and then I do battle against the rival. Usually at this point in the game, I am talking about the good new moves that my Pokemon has learnt, but at this point, I just have the moves that I had access to early on in the game, and I think this really proves to me why I didn't use Pidgeotto as a kid. However, I did read a heartwarming story in the comments on one of my videos where someone mentioned catching a Pidgeotto in Viridian Forest in Pokemon Yellow, then using it to defeat Brock, and sweeping the rest of the game with a Pidgeot. Honestly, well done. I'm sure that that was quite a challenging playthrough, especially when the moves stay this bad for this long. Now that the SS hand is departing, I need to make a decision. Do I try to face Surge right away, or do I head to Celadon City? And in this case, I wasn't really sure. I actually cut the tree outside of Surge's gym to get in there, and then I decided last minute that I don't think fighting him right now makes any sense. So I'll dig back to Cerulean City, pick up the bike, and then head towards Lavender Town. Now unfortunately for this flying type Pokemon, it doesn't have any flying type moves, and this could make the wrapping last slightly problematic. The issue here is usually that you can't one-hit the Oddish, and then it uses Stun Spore and allows the Bellsprout to endlessly trap you in Wrap. Luckily for me, on the first Oddish, I just knock it out with two hits from Quick Attack. It only tried to use Absorb. Honestly, not a very good move. Next is Bellsprout. Unfortunately for me, my Quick Attack isn't getting a one-hit, but then it uses Poison Powder, and that's perfect. Now the second Oddish can't use Stun Spore, and as a result, I take an easy victory over the first trainer in this gauntlet. Up next is the Pokemaniac with a Cubone and a Slowpoke. I don't really have a name for this guy. We should probably decide on a name for him, so put your suggestions in the comments. The nuisance here with Pidgeotto is that both of his Pokemon are decently defensive, so it takes a lot of hits to knock each of them out. Against the Slowpoke, things actually get a little bit scary because it is using Confusion, and this can confuse you. It only has a 10% chance though. It doesn't end up inflicting the status here, and Quick Attack takes it out. Okay, so it's time for the status condition junior trainer. I am not going to have any problems here because I resist her attacks, and normally the problem is that she'll put you to sleep and then spam absorb over and over and whittle you down. So Pidgeotto takes a quick victory here. And with her out of the way, I have to start mentally preparing myself for the self-destructing hiker. His team consists of two Geodudes and one Graveler. All of them know Rock Throw, as well as the move Self-Destruct, which in Generation 1 divides your defense stat by two during the damage calculation, so it does massive damage. You might look at Pidgeotto's moveset and go, Scott, you have no options for this fight. And uh, that isn't true, because what I can do is spam Sand Attack, lowering their accuracy. And what I'm hoping for here is that when they self-destruct, they don't hit me. And that is exactly what happens when the first Geodude blows itself up. Unfortunately, the second one hits a Rock Throw, doing a lot of damage, and then it connects with self-destruct, taking me all the way down to orange health. All right, so the Graveler is going to have to miss self-destruct, or I'm going to have to to set up so many sand attacks and then chip away at it with quick attack, it is going to blow itself up before then. However, in this case, as I'm setting up sand attacks, the most unlikely thing in the world happens. It hits Pidgeotto with Rock Throw, which does enough damage to get the KO. Okay, so there's no reason to go back and train or do anything else like use rare candies. I am going to have to rely on this sand attack strategy no matter what. Luckily this time, the first and second Geodude both self-destruct without hitting me, and that means I'm going to have enough health to survive the Graveler's self-destruct. And it does hit me, 
doing a lot of damage, but like I said, I have enough to survive. And now with his last Pokemon defeated, Pidgeotto is going to get major moveset upgrades. First of all, it can learn Wing Attack. Do remember that this is base 35 power in Generation 1. Still, it's much better than Whirlwind. After that, I head into Celadon City, and here I am going to explore the Rocket Hideout. After all, I want to pick up the TM for Double Edge, which could be useful for extra damage later on. Also, I really want to collect the extra rare candy in here. After that, I head to the department store. A lot of you keep telling me in the comments that I should buy all of the drinks at the top of the mart, and then give them to the girl so that I can sell the TMs for extra money. And pretty much in every first playthrough, this is how I play this section of the game. When I do things this way, Way, I have 50,000 Poké Dollars, and this allows me to buy 5 Vitamins. Today, since Pidgeotto has good speed, I think that buying 5 Protein makes the most sense. After that, I head west of the city, and out here I grab the HM for Fly, which I really wish wasn't going to be my best move, but it is, so let's teach it to Pidgeotto right away in the place of Gust. After that, in Lavender Town, I head south of the city to this guard tower where I can pick up the TM for Swift. In this case, it's kind of funny because I teach it in the place of Wing Attack, which I just learned. After all, I think that Quick Attack is better because it has priority, Swift is good because it bypasses accuracy checks and does more damage, and then Fly is a good flying type move. I'm keeping Sand Attack on my moveset just because it allows me to solve pretty much any problem. And now with those moveset upgrades, I am ready to backtrack to Vermilion City because I have to face Surge before I can use Fly outside of battle. So here's an interesting fact. By skipping him earlier, I have allowed my Pidgeotto to level up to level 32, and at this level it has 66 speed, which is one more speed than Surge's Raichu. I take a moment at the beginning of the battle to reorder my moveset. I want my most frequently used move in my first slot, and the second most frequently used move in my fourth slot. Then I use Swift, because the Raichu doesn't resist it, it does more than half. Raichu goes for Thunderbolt, and Pidgeotto survives on red health. This allows me to get one more Swift in, and finish Surge off. Okay, so I'm really glad that I made the choice to do Rock Tunnel first and then come back here after. Otherwise, that would have been a reset. Alright, so with Gym 3 out of the way, I'm going to head straight to Gym 4 in Celadon City. Now, I'm going to save in front of this first last, and you might go, why would you save there? You have a Flying-type Pokemon, it's going to be fine. No, you have to be careful, and if you're not sure why, go and check out my old Drowsy stream. I know it is four hours long, but you probably only have to watch like 30 minutes of it to understand why. I've now rooted this save into all my playthroughs for extra safety when I want to do training in Erica's gym. I defeat all of the trainers here before I'm finally ready to take on Erica herself. For this battle, I'm kind of assuming that Fly is just going to one-hit all of her Pokemon. I use it on the Tangela, and it doesn't one-hit. I get hit by Constrict, which lowers my speed. Okay, at least I am still faster than all of her Pokemon. I finish it off with Swift. Next is Weepin' Bell. I go for Fly, and this time I get the one-hit. Okay, Gloom's last. I go for Fly once again, and I one-hit. Okay, so Erica, as expected, was trivial for Pidgeotto. And now it's time to do a little bit of backtracking to Lavender Town because I haven't faced the rival in Pokemon Tower yet. If you fight him immediately after exiting Rock Tunnel, he can sometimes be a challenge, but when I'm this overleveled, he is going to be completely trivial. His highest level Pokemon is level 25, and I've defeated both Surge and Erica who have higher level Pokemon, so Pidgeotto has a quick sweep here. After that, I have to face Agatha Jr., the mandatory Chandler, with two Ghastly. Now, when I was a kid, if you had told me that Swift can't hit ghosts, but Fly can, I would tell you that that doesn't make any sense, because it seems like both of these moves would not hit ghosts. But Fly is a flying-type move, and these are allowed to hit ghosts, for some reason. Like, I guess if you were blowing air at the ghost or something like that, it would make sense, but flying moves are physical in Generation 1, so to me, it makes a lot less sense. Intuitively, to me, it seems like physical things should just phase through ghosts. Of course, that would make the typing really overpowered. Luckily, Pidgeotto has an option against these things, so it takes them out in one hit each. Okay, so let's head up to the top of the tower and face Jesse and James. Here, I just want to take a moment and let you all know how I think Pidgeotto's doing. If you look at the resets, I think it's going to give you a false sense of how good this thing is. Only two resets so far is respectable. 
However, Pidgeotto is going very slowly, 37 and a half minutes on the clock. Just for reference, I recently did two Victory Bell streams over on Twitch just for fun. The archives of those are available for YouTube members, just so you know. And in those playthroughs, I was able to get to Jesse and James in Pokemon Tower at 17 minutes. So Pidgeotto is 20 minutes slower than this, more than double the time. Obviously, Victory Bell is the top ranked Pokemon in my tier list, so it isn't really fair to compare these two because I expect Pidgeotto to be near the end of the tier list. And because of my expectations, for it and my experience playing these games, I can choose to make choices that will minimize resets, like doing some extra training here on Cycling Road. I'm going to battle all of these trainers at the top of the route that are closely clustered together. Then I'm in need of healing so I can quickly fly back to Celadon City, heal up in the Pokemon Center, and then head back to Cycling Road where I grab a rare candy and then continue my training. The advantage of doing the battles in these areas is that all the Pokemon here give good attack stat experience. You have to remember that in Generation 1 and 2, whenever you knock out a Pokemon, its base stats are added to your stat experience. Some people have questioned this approach because in later generations, EVs range from 0 to 255, but in generation 1 and 2, stat experience ranges from 0 to roughly 65,000. So by knocking out the fighting and poison types here, I am increasing my primary offensive stat. Actually, uh, my only offensive stat, Pidgeotto is not going to be using any special moves in this playthrough. Also here, here, I level up to level 40 where I can learn agility, which is my badge boosting move, so I definitely want to teach this. I'm going to teach it in the place of quick attack, because boosting my speed is functionally the same as getting priority. And then after that, I can pick up a hidden item here on the ground. I bet most of you don't know that this exists. It is a Max Elixir. I rarely pick this up because it usually messes with my bag so that I can't obtain other items in the Safari Zone immediately after this area. But today I'm going to pick it up since I want to do as much training as possible, and this can prevent trips back to the Pokemon Center. After that, I finish off the Safari Zone, and then for more attack stat experience, I head to the Fighting Dojo and quickly finish off all of these trainers. With them out of the way, I am now ready to face Koga's A. Venomoth. It is faster than me, and it sets up double team, which reduces Fly's accuracy to 62%, and as a result, it misses. Venomoth sets up another double team, and this reduces my accuracy down to 47%, and here I should mention that I'm making a critical misplay by choosing Fly for a third time. I have Swift on my moveset. It bypasses accuracy checks. I should definitely be using this move. I continue to choose Fly, get poisoned by Toxic, and then I finally figure out my mistake, choose Swift, and polish Koga's ace off. So even with some terrible play, I am able to earn myself the fifth badge, and with it comes a 12.5% boost to my speed stat. This badge also gives me access to Surf outside of battle, so I head to Pokemon Mansion so that I can use some more vitamins, and with that finished, I head back to Saffron City to explore Sylph. Now here I'm just going to briefly walk you through the route that I take during this location. My experience with Pidgeot taught me that I need a lot of leveling in the mid game, so I want to fight nearly all the trainers that I can in here. After all, once you defeat Giovanni, all of these people disappear. So what I do is I go to the fifth floor where I pick up the card key. This allows me access to every room as I go through the rest of the building. Then I head up to the 11th floor, fighting this trainer, and from here I am going to start moving down floor by floor, fighting every trainer along my way. Pidgeotto came into Sylph at level 45, and I am hoping to be at least level 50 before I get to the rival. Partway through my training, I realize that I need more PP, so I can just use the max elixir here to continue with my training. There's only a few more floors left, and it does look like Pidgeotto is going to get to level 50. It does before this scientist, actually. And after that, I head to the healing room and then fight the guy I call the Hypno Rocket. He has a team of Golbat, Drowsy, and Hypno. I always fight him last because he can cause some serious problems to happen if you don't have the ability to one-shot at least two of his Pokemon. I take an easy victory, bringing Pidgeotto up to level 51, and with that, I am now ready to face the rival for the first time. So the purpose of all of this overleveling is essentially to ensure that I'm going to one-shot the Jolteon when I make it to it. Also, I'm a medium-slow growth rate Pokemon, and I want to use agility to badge boost my attack stat. So I don't want to level up in the middle of the battle, and that means I'm going to need to be at a high level. Setting up agility against the Sand Slash has a problem though, and that's because this thing can use Poison Sting, which poisons me. It's really annoying. 
I finish it off on the next turn so I don't take poison damage. Ninetales is next, and then I finish it off with a critical hit from Swift. Okay, it's time for the Cloister. I expect that I'm going to have to two hit this thing. Yes, it looks like that's how it's going to be. It hits with Aurora Beam, taking me down to orange health, and then I finish it off. Of course, I move first against the Kadabra, polishing it off with a single Swift. And now it is time to see if I am going to one hit the Jolteon. And the answer is... No, I am not. It's going to barely survive. I'm going to take poison damage, and it's going to KO me with Thundershock. Okay, so let's dig out of Sylph and head back to Fuchsia City. Then I can head east towards Route 15, where I can fight trainers here to level up more. I figured that I only needed one damage rounding threshold to defeat the Jolteon because I was so close last time. However, in the very next battle against the rival, I arrive at the Cloister with such low health that it just goes for Aurora Beam and finishes me off. However, in the next fight, I make it by it with green health, and this allows me to once again go up against the Jolteon and try my damage with Swift. This time, it gets the one hit. I typically say that Giovanni in Sylph is the litmus test for if a Pokemon is truly awful. If it's even close here, you know you're dealing with something that's quite bad. Unfortunately for Pidgeotto, his Rhyhorn presents a problem because it's a rock type, and I have no good moves against this thing. At least I'm really overleveled, so my first fly does a lot of damage because of a critical hit. And then even when I don't get a critical hit because I've set up agility, I'm still able to do a lot of damage and polish it off with one more Swift. I have just more than half health before the Nido Queen comes out. It's checking types in a way that makes it prioritize Double Kick, which means it's never going to use its most terrifying move, Body Slam, and as a result, I am able to defeat Giovanni. Okay, let's continue in Saffron City and fight Sabrina next. Here, I have a completely foolproof combination of Agility, Flash, and Swift. I use Agility to badge boost myself, get hit by Avra's Flash, further badge boosting me, and then I can use Swift to bypass accuracy checks and easily sweep her team. Abra's a one hit, Kadabra's next, it's also a one hit, and finally it's time for Alakazam, I hit Swift, and it goes down in a single hit. Alright, time for more training. In Blaine's gym, I'm going to defeat all of the trainers here. By the way, you'll notice that I'm doing them in the opposite order. I decided at first not to fight them, and then after answering all of the questions correctly, I was like, no, 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 this is Pidgeotto we're talking about. Let's fight all of the gym trainers. With them out of the way, it is now time for the Fire-type gym leader, who is significantly better in Pokemon Yellow. The first strategy that popped into my mind was using Sand Attack to lower the Ninetales accuracy so that it's less likely to hit me with moves like Confuse Ray or Flamethrower. Unfortunately, it hits right away with a critical hit from Flamethrower, which does more than half. I decided to set up Sand Attack two more times in total, and then start using Agility to badge boost my attack as much as is possible before I move on to Blaine's next two Pokemon. Unfortunately, Ninetales is able to confuse me with Confuse Ray, I hit myself, it hits Flamethrower, and Pidgeotto goes down. Alright, so what happens if I just attack the Ninetales straight up? Well, in this case, Fly only does half. It confuses me, I hit myself, it hits Flamethrower, which burns Pidgeotto, cutting my attack stat in half, and that results in my second loss. Okay, so let's revert back to the first strategy, and I will just spoil this fight for you. It does not go well. Once again, I lose. Now in this case, I did try the fight one more time. You might be wondering, isn't this a bit stubborn? Well, I don't think it is. After all, Sand Attack is mostly a luck-based strategy, so I was figuring if I could set it up and then the Ninetales didn't hit me, that I would be able to sweep through Blaine's team and not have to waste significant additional time training up to a higher level. In this battle, I do manage to get by the Rapidash, but I have low health once the Arcanine comes out. It sets up Reflect while I'm in the air and then Fly misses. It hits Flamethrower and Pidgey goes down. So with five losses, I think it is time to dig out of the gym and do something else. If I surf east of Cinnabar Island, there are a lot of trainers that I can battle for additional experience, and once I reach and defeat this trainer by the Seafoam Islands, Pidgeotto is now level 60. So let's fly back to Cinnabar and face Blaine again. Alright, I think the Sand Attack strategy is the best. That allows me to set up and at least do more damage to the Rapidash and the Arcanine, but then the Ninetales just burns me right away with Flamethrower, so I'm going to reset here and not waste any additional time. 
This time I'm able to set up sand attack four times successfully, and then fully set up with agility, badge boosting my attack stat as much as is possible. I really wish this gave me better damage ranges, because the Ninetales just barely survives a single fly. I polish it off with Swift, move on to the Rapidash, and here, Fly gets the one hit. Alright, so it's all coming down to the Arcanine. Just to prevent it from using Reflect while I'm in the air, I go for Swift on the first turn, dealing more than half. Arcanine hits Fire Blast, but it isn't enough. My next Swift connects, and with that, I have finally defeated Blaine. If you play a lot of Red and Blue, I'm sure you're used to him being very easy, but I really just anticipate this being one of the hardest fights for most Pokémon. Now with that out of the way, it's time to head to the Viridian City Gym and face Giovanni. Now this fight with Pidgeotto is much different than it is for most Pokémon. The typical case is that Dugtrio and Persian are the hardest two Pokémon to finish off, because the Dugtrio can hit you with powerful moves like Dig, Fissure, and Earthquake, and then the Persian has guaranteed crits with Slash. Also, it can set up Double Team, which is really annoying. The Nidos can also be quite challenging because they have fantastic move sets, and then the Rhydon is usually quite easy because if you just outspeed it and have a grass or water type move, even an ice type move, you can usually knock it out. It has pretty bad special. However, with Pidgeotto, the Dugtrio is completely trivial, because the only move it can hit me with is Sand Attack. I take the time to mimic Earthquake and then set up Agility, boosting my attack stat, and then I use Earthquake to knock it out. Next is Persian, and I have Swift, so I'm not scared of Double Team. I almost one hit with Earthquake, it crits with Slash, and I finish it on the next turn. The Nidos that follow are actually trivial, because Earthquake can one-shot both of them, However, the Pokémon that I am really scared for is the Rhydon. And that's because I'm a flying type, and this thing knows Rock Slide. Also, Giovanni has good AI, so he is always going to use this move, or, uh, or he's going to use a Guard Spec. In this case, though, the Rhydon survives Earthquake, uses Rock Slide, connecting with Pidgeotto, and it doesn't knock me out! So I get a second Earthquake and finish it off. So, we've made it to the rival before the league. Here, I'm going to implement the strategy that I used with Pidgeot, which is to mimic the Sand Slash's Slash. Because my base speed is above 64, I am always going to get a critical hit with this move. Well, there is a 1 in 256 chance that I fail to get a crit, just because this game is Generation 1. Also, I do set up Agility here. I know I'm about to level up. I didn't look at that, so oops. But also, having the speed boost is going to be helpful so that I move first against the Jolteon. I finish the Sand Slash off, and now there's basically two questions. Will I be able to two-shot the Cloister with Slash, and will I one-shot the Jolteon? Alright, so it's time to see, will I be able to knock the Cloister out in two hits, and it looks like it. I survive the Aurora Beam, and finish it on the next turn. Cadaver is an easy one hit, and now it's time for the Jolteon. Will I get the one hit? And the answer is yes. Entering Victory Road, my Pidgeotto... Actually, I just realized, have I been saying Pidgeotto this entire time? I hope I have. I mess up Pidgeotto and Pidgeot all the time. It really feels like it should be like Pidgey, Pidgeot, and Pidgeotto, because Pidgeotto is the longest name and it sounds kind of the most impressive. I don't know, does anyone else mix these two up? I'm really sorry if earlier in the video I said Pidgeot, I meant Pidgeotto. Anyways, Pidgeotto is level 62, so I think I'm going to need to do some extra training. And I can do that here in Victory Road. There are a lot of trainers in here that give decent experience yields, and I train until I'm almost level 64. This is okay though, because then I'm going to fly to Cerulean City and head to the Power Plant. Here, I knock out a couple wild Pokémon, leveling me up to level 64, and I grab an extra rare candy. So now, I have a total of 12. I decided to use 6 and then fight Lorelei at level 70, but this is just not gonna work. So instead of that, I'm gonna level up one more time on Route 15, up to level 65, and then use 10 rare candies to take me up to level 75. Alright, so with one false start to the league out of the way, let's officially start my league attempt. For the battle against Lorelei, I think the best moveset is Rest, Mimic, Agility, and Fly. You might think that giving up Swift is a bad choice, since that's pretty much my most powerful normal type move, especially if you don't want to learn Double Edge. However, then I'm not able to successfully Mimic Amnesia and set it up on the Slowbro, because I do need to keep Agility to Badge Boost, and I need Rest to be able to heal. 
It's also worth noting that in Generation 1 there is no move deleter, so once I've taught Fly, I cannot get rid of it for the rest of the playthrough. The only way I could remove it would be to transfer my Pokémon to Generation 2, use the move deleter in Blackthorn City to delete Fly, and then transfer the Pidgeotto back. I've never really mentioned it before, but in my challenges I don't allow myself to do this. So as a consequence, it looks like Pidgeotto is mostly stuck with Fly as its damage dealing move, with the option to occasionally use Mimic to steal another one. Today, because I'm able to set up Amnesia, Lorelei is quite easy. Like, watch when Lapras hits me with Blizzard. It does almost nothing. Luckily, it doesn't freeze me, and I knock it out with one more fly. All right, so I'm playing the game with a Pokemon that is kind of a joke. However, do you know what's even more of a joke? the trainer that is in the very next room. I can mimic Dig from the Onyx and use that to knock out his rock types, and then Fly easily one-shots all of his fighting types. Yes, in this case, even the Machamp. So you might think that Agatha would be hard with Pidgeot, but that's really not the case. I can use Substitute to prevent her from using Confusion, and then after that I can set up with Agility, boosting my attack, and then sweep with Fly, because again, this can hit Ghosts. I figured that there would be some bad luck here eventually, because Hypnosis can still hit you when you have a Substitute in place, but there was no bad luck, so I just defeat Agatha on my first attempt. And with that, I have made it to Lance. Before him, I used some rare candies to take Pidgeot up to level 78, and now let's get into the battle. Okay, so I felt that there was a fun play to do here. I can set up Agility against the Gyarados, boosting my attack in Special, so that I take less damage from its hits. And then after doing that, I'm gonna mimic Hyper Beam, which I get Stab on. Then I can use this move to hopefully sweep through the rest of Lance's team. However, the Aerodactyl is a rock type, so I decided to use Fly against it, because I felt that Hyper Beam wouldn't one hit. Unfortunately for me, this does mean to get some damage in, and I was already quite bruised from the Gyarados, so Pidgeot ends up going down. Alright, let's go back to the standard play, so I'll set up Agility on the Gyarados, use Fly to knock it out, and the following Dragonair, and then at the second Dragonair, I'll use Mimic to steal Ice Beam, and then after knocking this Pokémon out with Fly, I can use Ice Beam on the Aerodactyl, as well as the Dragonite. And by doing that, I defeat Lance. Alright, so it's time to defeat the champion with Pidgeot. Now the flying type is a bit of an advantage here, because the Sand Slash cannot hit me with its most powerful move, Earthquake. As a result, I am going to take the time to mimic Earthquake here and then set up Agility, boosting my stats. After that, I go for Fly, knocking the Sand Slash out with two hits. Earthquake one-shots the following Alakazam. The Executor can't really do that much to me, so I decide to heal here so that I'm prepared for the rest of the fight. I knock it out with Fly and move on to the Cloister. Okay, so I assume that I'm going to have to two-hit this thing. Yes, Fly does more than half. Cloister strikes back with Ice Beam which doesn't actually do that much, I don't get frozen, and as a result, I finish it off. Okay, all that's left is Ninetales and Jolteon. This is the reason that I mimicked Earthquake. I one-shot the Fiery Fox, next is the Electric Doggo, I go for Earthquake, and I finish it off. So Pidgeotto beat the champion on its first attempt. It clocks in with a time of 1 hour 34 minutes and 45 seconds, with 11 resets at level 79. This took 5 hours and 47 minutes of game time. Alright, so now let's jump into my second playthrough and see if I can improve these results. The first choice I make is to fight the rival on Route 22 at level 10. I tested damage ranges for the champion fight, and it actually doesn't matter with my goal level. Either way, when I mimic Earthquake, I'm going to get the one-shot against both Magneton or Jolteon. I thought what might matter is the battle against the rival in Sylph, where he has Magneton. After all, the Sand Slash doesn't know Earthquake, and you don't have access to Mimic until you complete that area of the game. However, when I tested the damage ranges, if you use Agility three times and then use Swift on the Magneton, you still get the one hit. So there's only one more battle that might be problematic, and that is the battle against the rival on Route 22 for the second time. And here, it does matter which team you face. If you set up Agility three times, you get a one hit on the Jolteon, but not a guaranteed one hit on the Magneton. So for that reason alone, I think that it's a little bit safer just to finish off the rival here in the early game. Also, because Pidgeotto is pretty bad, I need as many levels as possible, so I might as well get a little bit of extra experience. 
After all, I am still going to go into the Brock fight at level 15. It is possible to beat Brock at a lower level, however, as will become evident during this fight, having more health is actually a benefit, and in this case I survive with only 13 hit points when I knock the Onyx out. While training in the early game does slow things down a little bit, I think in this case it's worth it for the added consistency. In the next section of the game I choose to do extra training by battling optional trainers. On Route 3 I fight the Bug Catcher instead of the Lass, this means I battle 2 extra Pokemon. And then in Mount Moon I battle a total of 6 optional trainers. The Bug Catcher by the entrance, the Weedle Bug Catcher, the Super Nerd, the Caterpie Bug Catcher, the Lass, the Rocket by Mega Punch, and finally the Youngster. The consequence of this is that I am 1 level higher when I battle the rival on Nugget Bridge. This battle in itself is not particularly hard for Pidgeotto, but again I am trying to accumulate experience for later on in the game. Now here I make a change. After Bill, I head straight to Vermilion City. What this allows me to do is explore the SSN and battle the rival here, leveling Pidgeotto up more before I backtrack to Cerulean City and face Misty. I lose no time to backtracking here because with Pidgeotto I am not going to fight Surge until after Rock Tunnel. All that this strategy allows is me to face Misty at level 28, which makes it much more likely that I'm going to defeat her without a reset. Immediately after her in this playthrough, I do get paralyzed by the wrapping last, but Pidgeotto luckily manages to pull through anyways. Okay, so can I make it through the self-destructing hiker on my first attempt? Well, the first unit uses self-destruct, taking me down to 34 hit points. The second one lands a rock throw, taking Pidgeotto down to 9 hit points. Yeah, this one is going to be a reset. Okay, well the second Geodude uses self-destruct and doesn't hit me, so now I have to make it through the Graveler fight. In this case, I actually get so many sand attacks set up that I start using quick attack and slowly chipping away at the Graveler. Eventually though, it does go for self-destruct, and it misses! So Pidgeotto makes it through on its first attempt. Outside the cave, I can go for Swift first, instead of backtracking here after doing Celadon. This just allows me to streamline my mid-game routing. Next, of course, I complete the Rocket Hideout, buy 5 Protein, and grab Fly, teaching it to Pidgeotto right away. And then, instead of backtracking to Surge, I head straight for Erica's Gym and fight all of the trainers in here for experience. After all, there's no rule saying that I have to face Surge as the third gym leader. I might as well just complete this area so that I'm level 36 when I face Surge. Now I can't believe I'm going to say this, but Surge actually has a chance of beating Pidgeotto here. If Thunderbolt crits, it will knock me out, and this is evident by how much damage it deals to me when it hits me here without a crit. However, this means he only has around a 20% chance to defeat me if he chooses Thunderbolt, and that is a 1 in 4 chance. So I like these odds, and I take a victory on my first attempt in this playthrough. So now the early game is over, and we're heading into the mid-game training portion of the run. I can't go into explicit detail about exactly which trainers I face and when I face them, but I am going to do my training in two major segments. The first one comes before Koga, where I defeat all the bikers on Cycling Road, as well as the trainers east of Fuchsia city on route 15. This brings Pidgeotto up to level 51. It gives guaranteed one hits against all of Koga's Venonats. It also gives an outspeed against the Venomoth, and it also gives Fly a 67% chance to one hit. In this case, unfortunately, I don't get it, but I just finish it off on the next turn with Wing Attack. Now it's time for the second major segment of training in Saffron City. I'm going to defeat all of the trainers in the fighting dojo, and then pretty much every trainer in Sylph. This gives Pidgeotto level 57 at the start of the rival fight. Now, I mixed things up here a little bit. I should have trained just slightly more to get 58 before this fight, because I level up and that ruins my badge boosts for the rest of the fight. This does have a consequence, which is I don't one-hit the Jolteon. However, in this case, it can choose between Double Kick or Thundershock, and it goes for Double Kick, so I win anyways. Also, Thundershock wouldn't have done enough damage to knock me out unless it got a critical hit. After that, I take a free win over Sabrina, and then I do more training until Pidgeotto is up to level 62. And this level is very specific before Blaine, because now I'm going to use 8 rare candies to take Pidgeotto up to level 70 before this fight. In the last playthrough, I had many resets to Blaine, and I want to prevent all of these to save as much time as is possible. By setting up agility twice, I have a 91% chance to one hit the Nine Hills, a guaranteed one hit on the Rapidash, and then a two hit on the Arcanine. By using this strategy, 
strategy, I take a first attempt victory over Blaine. Now in Giovanni's gym, I have to face three additional trainers, these guys right in the middle of the gym. This is so I reset Pidgeotto's experience bar for facing Giovanni. By doing this, I can set up agility and retain my badge boosts for the rest of the fight. What this does is give me guaranteed one hits against both of the Nidos, and it does give me a 40% chance to one hit the Rhydon. I don't get it, it hits Rock Slide, but I have more than enough health and defense to survive it and finish him off on the next turn. Using the Slash strategy on the rival on Route 22 gives me a quick and easy victory, and now I am off towards the League. In Victory Road, I face three additional trainers, the two cool trainers in the first area, and then the Black Belt that is the third trainer in the entire cave. This levels Pidgeotto up to level 73, and then I backtrack to the Power Plant to pick up one more rare candy. Now before Lorelei, I can use two rare candies to take Pidgeotto back to level 75, and then I go into the fight against her with the exact same strategy that I had last time. In the first battle I made an error of judgment. I have a 25% chance to two hit the Cloister using Fly with no setup. I figured that I would get it, and Lorelei has a chance of using Super Potions when the Cloister is at low health, giving me chances for additional rolls, but in this case she just keeps healing, keeps using Ice Beam, and Pidgeotto faints. However, there is an easy remedy to my stupidity. What I can do is just set up agility, then I have more damage for the Cloister, and by doing that I can make it to the Slowbro, where I can mimic Amnesia, and then sweep the rest of Lorelei's team after healing with rest. Now being level 75 has its perks, because once I defeat the next trainer, I level up to level 76, and this allows me to use two rare candies to take Pidgeotto up to level 78 over the next damage rounding threshold before I face Agatha. She's trivial to defeat, and with that I've made it to Lance. For this fight, setting up agility two times is incredibly important. The first Dragonair knows Thunder Wave, which can paralyze you and ruin your speed as well as your consistency. However, with two turns of badge boosts, I can one-hit it and move on to the second Dragonair. Here, I mimic Ice Beam, survive its critical hit Ice Beam with only two hit points, and from there, the rest of Lance's Pokémon are all guaranteed one-hits. And I know that I'm not going to level up mid-battle here because I've planned it so that I level up after the Dragonite. This gives me a fresh level for the champion so that I'm not going to lose my badge boosts mid-fight here. In these solo challenges, I'm always trying to optimize for the fewest turns possible in a battle. In this case, I use agility on the first turn, boosting my defense stat, meaning I'll take less damage from Sandslash's hit, and then I immediately mimic Earthquake and attempt to sweep. The reason is, I only need one agility to get optimal ranges on all of his team. It gives me a 99% chance, so basically a guaranteed chance to two-shot the Sandslash. I already I already had a guaranteed one hit on the Alakazam with Earthquake, but next is Executor, and I only had an 80% chance to knock it out with Fly, whereas with one agility, I can knock it out in a single hit. Okay, so I've been spending a lot of time talking about this strategy, and now I have to mention one calculated risk with it, and that's the fact that I only have a 25% chance of knocking the Cloister out in two hits. I am likely just going to three hit it. What I figured is that it's going to use one Ice Beam and one Aurora Beam, it is randomizing between those two moves, and that I should have enough health to survive that. However, in this case, it just freezes with the first Ice Beam, which is really frustrating. Okay, so I tried for the more risky strategy. I got punished by something unrelated, but I'm going to play this next battle a little bit more conservatively and set up entirely with agility. The only damage range in the fight that this improves is my damage range against the Cloister. I now have a 96% chance to two-hit it. However, that isn't factoring in the fact that the Cloister can use Aurora Beam, drop your attack stat, and this once again makes it a three-hit. Actually, in this case, case of four hits, so I have to tank even more damage. Luckily, Pidgeotto survives. I then use Rest on the Ninetales because my attack is two stages lower, so I am no longer going to get one hits on this Pokemon or the final Jolteon. I take the Ninetales out, move on to the final Pokemon. It goes for Thunder, Pidgeotto survives, and I finish the game. In its second attempt, this middle evolution, early bird, gets a time of 1 hour, 25 minutes, and 10 seconds, with two resets at level 79. This took 5 hours and 31 minutes of game time. Alright, so in comparison with my first playthrough, these results are actually pretty good. I was able to save just under 10 minutes of time. And in Generation 1, where results range somewhere between 35 minutes and 2 hours, this is a big time savings, and I'm really happy with it. Also, the two resets that I had really came about because I wasn't playing conservatively with my strategies. I felt that I could get by both Cloisters without setting up agility too many times and wasting time. However, 
that came back to bite me and I had to do the setup anyways. So overall, this final playthrough felt pretty good. However, when we compare these results with all of the other results in Pokemon Yellow, Pidgeotto did not do well, and I don't think any of us expected it to. Currently, I've removed Dragonair from the tier list just because I played it so long ago and I didn't do two playthroughs. So right now, when I rank Pidgeotto, it is going to be the first mid-stage Pokemon in the tier list. Unfortunately for today, its results place it in the E tier. This is the largest tier currently, and that is because it features Pokemon with such a wide range of times. For instance, Meowth has a time of 1 hour 12 minutes and 18 seconds, whereas Rhyhorn has a time of 1 hour 28 minutes and 54 seconds. Unfortunately for this little bird, it is near the end of these times. It ends up beating out Seal's time by a minute and 29 seconds, but it is slower than Goldeen. So today, Pidgeotto earns itself a spot at the end of the E tier. Because this is the Pidgeotto video, I actually noticed an error in my tier list, and that is the fact that Pidgeot is currently ranked ahead of Surfing Pikachu. It did not, in fact, do as well as the Surfing Rodent, so let's correct the record. Looking forward into the future, I have the ambition of completing my Pokemon Yellow tier list by the end of 2024. Again, don't be sad, I still have lots of other Generation 1 stuff to do. A whole bunch of Nuzlocks, as well as a solo series in Pokemon Red, as well as a solo series in Pokemon Blue where I don't use any TMs. However, coming up sometime next year, I am going to have to beat the game with only a Pidgey. And with how its evolved form did today, I think that it might be destined for the F tier. Let me know how you think Pidgey is going to do in the comments, and then when I end up doing that video, we can all check back here to see how the predictions work. Like, subscribe, ring the chime echo so you'll be notified when my next video goes live. By the way, I am releasing more than one a week, so I am going to do another video tomorrow with another middle evolution. So we are going to find out what kind of results Gloom can get in Pokemon Yellow. And believe me, I think that that playthrough is going to be very surprising, especially considering where Vileplume is placed in the tier list. If you support me on Patreon or through YouTube memberships, thank you so much, it means the world to me. Now, if you've made it this far, you're incredible. I'll see you in my next video. Okay, so now it is time to defeat Oak with only Pidgeotto. I start this fight off by setting up agility in the hopes of badge boosting my other stats. I wasn't looking at my experience bar. Usually by the time I get to this fight, I'm quite exhausted, and I always do this after my second playthrough. On most days when I film, the approach that I take is I film the first playthrough, then I do optimization immediately after, take a small break for lunch, and then I come back and do the second playthrough. So I'm usually quite tired by this time. Luckily, I don't level up going into the Executor, who is second, and here I'm going to mimic Stomp so that I have a normal type move. After all, it does have a 30% chance to flinch the opponent, and Pidgeotto is very fast with agility. I crit the Arcanine not once, but twice, and then Blastoise comes out, it goes for Skull Bash, which I can just counter by using Fly, it misses, and then my Fly gets a critical hit. Okay, so all that's left is the highest level trainer Pokemon in the game. It's Gyarados. I hit Fly, doing about a third. It hits Leer. And then on the next turn that I'm on the ground, it hits Leer again. And I take a first attempt victory against Oak. Alright, I'll see you all tomorrow in the Gloom video.